loud now. So hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming this evening. So uh, we have Jennifer Thompson with us tonight. So Jennifer came back in the spring and was uh, showing us how to start plants indoors. So I don't know if any of you attended that one. It was really great. But tonight she's going to be uh, talking about saving seeds. So Jennifer uh, works for Links for Greater, Greener Learning. Uh, and it's helping to connect folks Lots in the community garden so that they can grow their own food. Uh, she also started up a new community garden in Dane City, which the community is coming together to plan. She runs a program to help connect our Niagara region newcomers to green spaces and a deeper connection to the land and the environment. So great things that she does here. So I'll turn it over to Jennifer and she will do the program for us. Thanks, Jennifer. Wonderful. Thank you, Annie, for inviting me and thank you everyone for coming. Um, feel free to do whatever you want to do with your videos on or off. Uh, if you have questions, I I'm happy to field them as they arise. Or if you're worried you're going to forget your question, you could pop it into the chat. Do we have a chat going? Yeah. You could pop it into the chat uh, or just unmute yourself and ask. That's fine too. Just be mindful that uh, we are recording. So your question would, would show up while you're asking it. I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. Can you see my PowerPoint right now? Thumbs up if you can. Yeah, I see it. Yes, nod. Perfect. Can. Thank you. Awesome. So I work with Links for Greener Learning and I'm also involved in the Niagara Community Garden Network, which is an organization that's working to connect all of the community gardens together and share resources, uh, including seeds. So I thought I'd just start off with, oops, why save seeds? So all of you who are attending tonight are thinking about saving seeds for some reason. Uh, and this is not a, a full list, but just some things I thought of are it's definitely cheaper, of course, to save your seeds instead of buying your packets of seeds. Uh, we are maintaining some diversity because if you have grown out some seeds that are heirloom seeds, for example, we're able to grow foods that are not uh, available in the grocery stores. So we're getting access to a greater variety, more colors, different flavors of our vegetables and our flowers as well. And then a really important reason to save seeds is that also you're moving forward genetic material that is growing really well in our environment. So I even find that Welland has a different climate than St. Catharines. They seem to be a little bit ahead of us. So I'm, I'm being particularly mindful of seeds that have done well in Welland specifically this year. Uh, and I'm happy to share those with the Welland Public Library. Uh, and Annie was just saying, if you are saving seeds this year, uh, she's not certain if she can collect them this year, but you can still save them and then give them a year into the future. They'll just be labeled 2021. So now I've got seeds that from plants that are doing really well, they're adapting to climate change. You know, I have a very, I have some of that Haldeman clay on my property. So um, I know that I want <laughs> plants that do well in that sort of clay soil. So I'm also selecting for plants that do well in my soil. And then of course, it's a lovely piece of culture in, in gifting and it brings you into community that you're growing the same seeds as your neighbor potentially or other community members. Um, and it also connects you to a lineage, like potentially, I wish this were true, but I wish that I was growing seeds that my grandmother was growing and that I kept growing them forward. Uh, but instead, I'll, I'll be the grandmother that passes these seeds on. So it's never too late. Uh, you can also get a hold of seeds that come with a story and, um, and carry that story forward as well. And I always, friends of mine that live in Montreal, they always mail me for Christmas 
seeds that did well at their property too. And I always pop them in here too. So it's just a nice gift to give to somebody, uh, the gift of seeds. And then of course we talked about getting better taste and, and more beauty out of our garden that's not necessarily found in the grocery store. So which seeds are best to save? If you are growing out seeds that are hybrids, so if the seed package said F1 or it says this is a hybrid, those plants can be really lovely where they've crossed different parents together, which both have a really wonderful trait. For example, maybe they want a tomato to be really red and they want it to be finished early and they've crossed those two together. So you don't wanna save seeds that are hybrids because what will happen is if you save that seed and try and grow it again, it won't look the same as the hybrid plant you originally grew. It's gonna revert back to one of its parents. Uh, and then you get the, the undesirable qualities of that parent uh, there as well. So, so you're getting a, a less uh, delicious product. So it's good to stick to these heirloom varieties. And so the word heirloom just means that it's gonna be true to type, that we have um, grown these seeds out season after season after season, and it always produces a, a consistent varietal. I'll just show you, before I move on, I'm gonna show you an example. I switched to my other camera here. So these are heirloom seeds that were grown on the Start Me Up Niagara farm. And they are bean seeds and they're really beautiful. So these are tiger eye. So you would never in the grocery store find tiger eye seeds that you could soak and, and turn into a nice chili. These are really pretty. So again, these are heirloom seeds. Every time I grow them out, they're gonna look the same. They're called painted pony. Very beautiful beans. And these are Alice Sunshine heirloom beans. And these originated from a woman named Linda Crago who lives in the Niagara region. And I can't remember the name, Twig and something in Twig <laughs> that she, uh, the farm that she works on. And she's also affiliated with Start Me Up Niagara's farm as well. So these are really beautiful heirloom seeds and I've kept them for a couple of years now. And so I'm gonna grow them out next season as well. So back to sharing my screen. So if you've got cross pollinating crops, they make things a little more complicated because now you've got wind and other pollinators that are moving DNA around and making offspring or fruits that are not true to type. And I'll just show you another example of this one. I've been, we moved here from Toronto a few years ago. So we've been just trying to grow some watermelons. And this was supposed to, like on the seed package, it was labeled that pink watermelon type. And this is a fully ripe watermelon. And even though I didn't grow any other melons this year, it's, it's totally ripe, it's nice and juicy, but you can see the color is very pale and it actually, I mean, it doesn't taste bad, but it also doesn't taste good. It tastes, it's kind of tasteless actually. So this just means that my red watermelon plant, I must have a neighbor or somebody's compost heap that is growing some other type of watermelon and some pollinator went into the flower of that watermelon and then came to the female flowers on my watermelon and, and crossed their DNA. So that happens and it's really hard to control, but it just goes to show you, I wouldn't bother to save these seeds because they're no longer gonna give me that red variety of watermelon. today. I'm just going to
gonna move that, there we go. So you wanna also select seeds from the very best plants, the ones that don't have any disease and no pest damage if you can do that. P uh, pests usually go after the weakest plants. So ideally we won't be picking those ones for seeds. And then of course you can select the traits that you want to move forward in your food lineage. So you might want the really large tomatoes, the ones that taste really well. They did really well specifically in your garden. If you want your tomatoes to ripen earlier, you can save the seeds from the tomato that ripens first every year. And after three or four years, you're going to be having a whole bunch of tomatoes ripening even early. If you're interested in flowers, which are always nice for pollinators and for beauty, you can also select certain colors of flowers as well. So five of the easiest plants for seed saving, and this is because they're most likely to be true to form. They're not gonna be reverting back to some parent plant. These are my peas, my beans, my lettuce, tomatoes, and peppers. So if you're new to seed saving and you wanna save anything this year, pick one of these five, or you could try and go for all five. But this is a really great place to start. You're gonna be happy when you plant these seeds next year. So peas and beans. These ones, peas especially, are a nice spring harvest. When, we're wanna, when we wanna save our seeds from our peas and our beans, we're gonna let them fully mature. And we're talking about the seeds now. We want the seeds to fully mature while they're in your garden. So this is four to five weeks past your eating time. And then you're just gonna give that seed pod a little wiggle. And if you can hear a rattle, then it's ready to harvest. They're nice and dry. And you're gonna go ahead and move, remove those peas or beans from the pod and put them in an envelope. They're good to go. I'm gonna show you now an example. So here are, somebody gave me these amazing seeds one year. I think it was actually my friend from Montreal. Uh, it's just this giant slicer bean. When they're green, they look more like this. And so they're starting to get old right now. We've already sort of eaten as many as we were gonna eat. And then I pickled as many of them as I, as I possibly could get my hands on. So I've already done everything I'm gonna do with my slicer beans. And so the rest I've just let go to seed. So I don't know if you can hear that. my mic you can see there's a you can hear there's a rattle here so i know that when i pop this open i'm going to have some beautiful seeds in here and i'm happy to donate these to the well and library because i i have quite a few of them um, whenever i have more seeds than i know what to do with i i always give them away and then they do last anywhere from three to 10 years, depending upon the varietal. So I don't have to grow these out next year. I could grow them out two years for now, but I always save seeds anyways. So might as well start fresh. So those are my nice slicer beans. And chickpeas, here's a couple of pictures. I was hoping I could just be outside and show you all my plants right where they are growing, but my internet wasn't great for that. So I'll just took some, I'm going to show you some pictures from my garden. So on the left, I've got my chickpeas. Uh, this is only my second year growing chickpeas, so I'm pretty excited about them. They make these very tiny pods. And then the similar to the bean, they go ahead and ripen up. So I'll show you here. So here are my beautiful chickpeas. And they are, I'll put it up to my mic, they're rattling away inside here. 
And I can also give them a little squeeze to see what size they are. So if I popped one of these open, I'm gonna end up with a garbanzo bean or a chickpea here. And so this is the seed that I would plant next year. Having said this, I started with a bag of garbanzo beans from the grocery store, like just a cheap bag filled with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these that you would hydrate and make hummus out of. And, and they were viable. A lot of them were viable. So there you go. That's, that's a cheap way to get seeds too, is if you end up with a big bag of garbanzo beans that are dried, but they happen to be viable seed. Coming back to the PowerPoint here. So our next one is lettuce. So lettuce, if you're growing lettuce this year, I'm sure you've had the experience of having your lettuce bolt, meaning that it's not staying low to the ground, making this delicious sweet green. It sometimes bolts straight up because it's stressed out for some reason. And usually it's because of the heat. So when lettuce wants to go ahead and complete its life cycle, it's gonna bolt up and make these flower stalks and also make its seeds. So when you're looking at your bolted lettuce and it starts to make this dandelion fluffy stuff, that means that the seeds of your lettuce are dry and ripe. So you can just go ahead and shake those stalks over a paper bag and then gently remove the fluff from the seeds, pop your seeds into an envelope and label those up. Peppers. Peppers are super easy as well to save seeds from. You just have to let the pepper fully develop on the plant. And it's, I, I think they're still edible at this point. They'll be darker in color and a little bit wrinkly, but still perfectly edible. And all you need to do is just pick it, cut it in half, rub it and shake this, those seeds out, just like you would do if you were cleaning up a pepper to cook with except instead of chucking those seeds into your compost, you're gonna spread them onto a coffee filter and you're just gonna let them dry really well for one to two weeks. And then again, pop them into an envelope. I'm gonna show you a pepper here. So here I have this, these always do really well in my garden, these yellow banana peppers. They do so well, which makes me feel inspired to grow them every year. Um, but I'm not finding them particularly tasty. So I think I'm going to be on the hunt for a better varietal or better seeds for my, for my peppers. But if I did want to save this, right, all I would do is pop that out and scrape all these beautiful seeds onto a coffee filter. You want to avoid putting your seeds onto paper towel because once they are on paper towel, it's virtually impossible to get them separated from that paper towel once they dry. So coffee filter works really well. Wax paper is also fine as long as you give them a little bit of a stir every now and again to make sure you've got nice airflow. So I'd let these dry for one to two weeks and then pop them in a labeled envelope. And then tomatoes. Tomatoes are really fun to save seeds from. And I love saving the varieties of tomatoes that are the heirloom ones. So I might choose this year. Uh, I had a green one with these sort of orange stripes on it that were really beautiful. This is, uh, oh, you can't see that. So I'll just stop this for a second. This is an envelope that I got from the Grimsby Public Library last year who was doing a seed program before I knew the Welland one was. And so somebody donated purple bumblebee, which is red and purple. These are cherry tomatoes uh, and they have metallic green stripes. Like that's super cool. You're never gonna see that in the grocery store. So uh, we grew these out this year and I saved seeds from them. And then I've also got this beautiful yellow tomato that I'm gonna save seeds from. I might choose a bigger one, but uh, this one I thought I would chop up. So 
I'll just take you through the word part of this first. So I would slice open my tomato in half and scoop out the seeds and then just pop those seeds into a clear mason jar and add a little bit of water. And then I'm gonna cover that and let it ferment for one to three days. And it does get pretty stinky because it's fermenting and it also will start to make some mold on the top, right? It's just like letting your tomatoes rot in the ground, except we rearrange them so that we can get the seeds out. So tomatoes have this gelatinous substance, which is actually a germination inhibitor. So I wanna make sure that germination inhibitor is not on my seeds anymore. So the fermentation process deactivates that mucilaginous coating so that my seeds will be viable for next year. So I'll show you how I would do this. So here is my tomato. Uh, you can chop it either way. I always chop it like it was an equator so that you have access to all the locules. Uh, otherwise you'll have some locules that are buried behind where you can dig out. And then I'm just gonna take a spoon and scoop out my seeds. And I, I might get some pulp there too, no problem. I can also just give it a little squeeze and they're just gonna plop right out. Oh yeah, this is gonna be good. And I can still eat this tomato once I've gotten rid of the seeds, it's gonna be delicious. So I would try and get all the seeds from one tomato. And if you are, saving uh, tomato seeds, you also might wanna take some seeds from a whole bunch of different tomatoes instead of all the seeds from one tomato. And then I would pour a little bit of water like so. And then a couple times a day, I would give this mixture a stir. And I don't wanna add too much water, just a little bit of water because I want the fermentation process to start pretty quickly and all those nice yeasts that were on my tomato are now gonna to start to break down my sugars. And then it's gonna to start to get really stinky around day three. And as soon as that mold layer forms on the surface, I know that it's time to, to harvest those seeds. If you let it go any longer, those seeds might start to sprout. Uh, they'll all sink to the bottom because as soon as that germination inhibitor is deactivated, they, they'll just go ahead and think it's time to sprout. So it's important that I move them to the drying out process where they won't sprout. Coming back to my slideshow. So here on the left, the left picture, you can see that mold layer I was talking about, that stinky mold layer. So that's the sign that your seeds your, your whole mason jar has fermented properly. And then you, in the middle picture, you can see that all the good seeds actually sink to the bottom. So that makes it easy to separate and strain. So I could just spoon out all the gunk that's on the top. And then I can dump my whatever's left in that jar into a nice strainer and run some water over it, give it a nice rinse. And then I could dump those onto a coffee filter and let them dry out really well and then pop them into an envelope. Uh, sorry, one more thing about tomatoes. My husband would want you to know this, that he's never ferment <laughs> fermented his tomatoes in his life. And I think if you're only gonna save seeds one season, you can get away with scraping your tomato like scraping the seeds out of your tomato. And then he just scrapes them and spreads them onto wax paper and lets that dry. And they are viable the next year. Maybe if he was saving them for two or three years, he'd have to switch to this process. Um, but he's quite happy not bothering with any of this, just spreading out the seeds onto wax paper, let it dry for a couple of weeks, and then pop those into an envelope. I will say uh, his tomato seeds do have dried up tomato on them. 
So it's, they are most more likely to mold if any moisture gets in there, but so far so good. So if you wanna save seeds from herbs, also very wonderful, you're saving money here, very easy to do. You just want to let your herbs go to flower and then you're gonna let those flower heads dry right out and snip the flower heads off let them dry completely in a warm, dry place inside. And then you'll just shake those seeds out right into an envelope. So super easy. Here is, so cilantro now looks like it has all gone to seed for me. I, I've seeded some more so that I'll have some more in the fall. Um, but this is a picture I just took yesterday, the one on the right. So all of my cilantro is now coriander seed. And I'll show you. I've got a, when did I do that? this one here? So here is my cilantro plant that I let go to flower. And then now it's just making all these beautiful seeds. And I would just, you know, get together with some friends, put a big pile of seeds in front of us and we'd pick them all off the stalk. Um, you can also just rub, there are lots of shortcuts if you need it, right? Rub, rub your hands and they'll all fall off. So there we go. And so these can be used in your spice cabinet if you need coriander and, and they're viable seeds, uh, which just like the chickpeas, you can just buy coriander seeds from the grocery store and I find them more often than not to be viable seeds. So you can grow cilantro from your coriander seed. Coming back, so this is, I'm growing some holy basil this year and they're in various stages of life. I have some flowering ones and then some that are starting to make seeds. So I'd let them go another while yet uh, until the seeds are nice and ripe and then they'll move very easily into a bag for storage. If you want to save seeds from your squash, your melons, and your zucchini, again, you want to be mindful that you don't have a hybrid. So if you have an heirloom squash, then your seeds are going to be true to type, and you can go ahead and save those. So this one's super easy. You just slice open your, your fruit, remove the pulp and the seeds, fire them into a strainer. Um, it's basically the process that you would do if you wanted to roast pumpkin seeds when you're carving your jack-o'-lantern, right? Except you're more devoted to taking the time to get all the seeds out. And then you're gonna spread them on a cookie sheet and just let them dry completely after they've been rinsed really thoroughly with a sieve. And then same thing, put them in an envelope and label them up. So this is a picture here that I just took yesterday of my cucumbers, the ones that are still out there. There are still some harvestable ones. And then I have these other ones that I just didn't get to and they'll start to be ballooning out and turning yellow. So these are good candidates for seed saving because you know they're past eating and the seeds are starting to ripen. So this is very similar to saving seeds for a tomato. You want to slice it open, scoop those seeds out into a mason jar, add a little bit of water, let it ferment, and then same as we did for the tomato, get rid of that scum layer, that mold layer, uh, and then give them a rinse in a sieve, and then spread them out nicely on a coffee filter. Let them dry really, really well and put them in an envelope. This is a picture. I, I don't have bok choy in harvestable state yet. I, I have seeded it, but it's, it's quite hot. Should be coming up again for my for fall harvest. But bok choy makes these little seed pods. Uh, and those I can harvest those seed pods and use those next year. Here, my broccoli is, is still coming along pretty well in florets. You just have to make sure you pick those florets of broccoli. 
Uh, and of course, the varieties you grow at home are often going to have much tinier pieces of broccoli than what you see at the grocery store. So as soon as it looks like broccoli, I always pick it right away because it, if you don't, by the time it, it flowers, makes its yellow flowers, then it's not edible anymore. It just won't taste very good. And then the picture on the right uh, was that I was at a garden a couple of days ago, and I, I don't know if you can see it very well, but there are a bunch of aphids on that plant and it's kind of moldy. And so this would not be a good candidate to take seeds from, from that plant. I'd look for a nice healthy plant uh, and wait for the seed pods to ripen fully and save those. Flowers. Flowers are also really lovely to save seeds from. And people who care a lot about selecting particular traits of flowers will go out into a flower patch and tie strings and label the flower whose seeds they're going to save. So for example, if I wanted to if I had a whole bunch of zinnias and I really wanted purple zinnias to move forward because there's less of those out there apparently, purple is kind of a more rare color, I would tie a string around all of the zinnia stalks while they're in flower so I can remember. Once things go to seed, you have no idea what they looked like uh, as, as a flower. So you tie it around when it's a flower and then I know in the fall, that I'm gonna save the seeds from all of the flowers that have strings tied around their stalks. If you don't care about selecting particular traits, it doesn't, it doesn't matter as much about tying strings around, you'll just pull off a bunch of seed heads. So you're gonna let your flower heads dry out in, on site in your garden, or you can snip the flower heads off and dry them inside in a dry place. But Mostly you'll let those seeds ripen up nicely uh, wherever they are. And then again, super easy, just shake those seeds out into an envelope, give them a nice label. So I thought I would just show, show you some pictures of plants and seeds that I have in my garden right now. This was my first time growing something called Nicotinia and the seed catalog said it makes a really amazing smell. And it does, it does in the evening. Um, I did have to go, I don't know. I don't know if I'm gonna grow this one again, but I will save some seeds. And so you can see the seeds are very tiny and some of the flowers are there and some seed heads are already there and nice and ripe. Calendula I use for so many things. I infuse the dried flowers into oils and make a bunch of salves and lotions and lip balms. Um, so I know I'm going to be growing calendula year after year after year. So I'm going to save calendula seeds and I'll show you my calendula. So these are actually the seeds I have left over from last year. In the fall, I just clipped so many seed heads and plunked a bunch of seeds into here. So I have tons of calendula seeds. And then this is from this year where it's still nice and intact. And the shape of calendula seeds, I just find them so hard to miss. They make this little spiral. I don't know if you can see that very well. I'll get a big one. There, there's a bigger one, so it's easier to see. There's actually three seeds there. They make that beautiful spiral. So really good for wound healing, sunburns. Calendula is a really wonderful medicinal plant. So I make sure I grow that one every year. And then I've got, this is what my hibiscus looks like right now. Um, some of you might have hibiscus in your in your garden as well. And it's amazing that this plant can get so far from a seed, really. These are like plate-sized flowers. And I'll show you again. So I've got 
I've got plate sized flowers, but then I also have some of the flowers that have dried up and they've started to make seeds. So they look more like this. But what will happen in time is even this outer part will fall off. And these inside parts here, you'll be able to open them up and get ripe seeds. So this is from last year's hibiscus. If I, all I have to do is shake it and I've got some nice hibiscus seeds here. So I might save the seeds of hibiscus that's done really well in which it did this year. So I'm gonna make sure I save seeds from my hibiscus. And this is a really beautiful flower that I have so many seeds from. I'm going to donate some to the well and library. So if you want any of these in your garden, it's called Love in the Mist. And you can see from the flower on the left there, they make this beautiful misty green part to them, almost like a passion flower. And then they have this beautiful blue. Some of them are white, this just gorgeous flower. And then it has another stage where it makes its seed pods after it flowers, but even they are beautiful. They have that red stripe and green stripe and they're still in those pod forms. And then the picture I just took yesterday, now they are all already seed pods that are ready to harvest. So these are one of the first flowers in the spring that I have uh, flowering. So it makes sense that they're already making seed. So here is my love in the mist. And like, look how easy it is to get seeds out of this guy. Super easy. So I will definitely donate some of these because these are seeds worth spreading. So beautiful. Hollyhocks. My hollyhocks did really well this year, and I am definitely going to save seeds from them. Let me see the state. The seeds are almost ripe. So I took the picture on the right yesterday, and I would still let them dry out a little bit more, but I could just clip those off and let them dry inside as well. So here we go. Here are my hollyhocks. I just clipped this off yesterday, but look how easy it is to get seeds out of my hollyhock. And they're nice size seeds too. I like working with them for planting. And again, it's amazing how you can get such a beautiful flower, so much potential in these little guys here. And again, I've got tons of hollyhocks. I'll probably donate some. Um, this is a, an envelope. Somebody at the Grimsby Public Library donated dark purple hollyhocks. And then they were kind enough to give information about growing conditions. So they said full sun, make sure you keep them moist, well-drained soil, and sow your seeds a week before the last frost and put them in a quarter inch deep. So that's really wonderful if you can pass on specific instructions like that, but you don't need to, as long as you've got the variety and then you might have the type and the variety. So the type is hollyhock and then the variety would say dark purple. You could just find online when the best spot, best time is to plant those. But that was nice of this person to label that so well. So I did grow these and yes, they were dark purple and they were very beautiful. So it's lovely. I feel connected to the gardener that donated those. And then marigolds, I always save seed from because they're just so easy to grow and they're really good for pest management in my garden. So I'll plant them scattered around all my veggies because uh, it keeps a lot of the aphids and other insects away from my veg. Uh, they'd prefer the marigolds. And do I have marigolds here? Yes, I do. I'll show you. So I clipped a head off my marigolds. Some, most of my marigolds are in flowers, but if this has already finished flowering, and if I just roll it like so, look at these cool seeds. They look like 
porcupine needles. Those are the seeds of a marigold. So, I mean, you get so many seeds from one flower. It's unbelievable. So I'm happy to pass those along as well. This is a flower that just showed up in my garden. Sometimes that happens where you get these volunteers where, I don't know, a bird drops a seed from someone else's garden. It is super beautiful. The seeds aren't perfectly ripe yet, but it's this Mexican sunflower. So, so, so nice. Um, when they are ripe, I'm definitely gonna save seeds from those. So thank you to the bird who dropped those off. And that's all I wanted to show you content wise, which is a lot of content, I realize. Uh, I'm happy to make these slides available to you. But just in closing, in order to make sure your seeds are viable, meaning that they'll actually produce fruit the, the next year, you need to make sure your seeds are fully ripe and well dried out. And when you're drying them, just make sure you're keeping them out of sunlight. And then they're really clean. So you don't want any of the other parts of the plant accompanying those seeds when you're plunking them in the envelope. Although truth be told, I have left beans in the pod and they were totally viable the next year. But ideally, we're trying to keep the moisture and the mold away. And then proper seed storage. We're gonna put all of our seeds in those nice envelopes that we label, put them in a mason jar and put them in a nice cool dark place. And they'll keep for three to 10 years. So every few years, just to be sure you catch the low end of the range, you wanna make sure you grow those seeds out and replace your seed stores with fresh seeds. And that's it. Let me just stop my screen share. And I'll switch my video. Oops, what did I do? This one, there we go. I'm back. <laughs> you must have a okay. garden. <laughs> I must have a huge garden. We have, yes. yeah, we have about an acre, but I also collect things from some of our community gardens as well. Oh, great. That was so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, really really interesting and uh, yes the Welland Library would love some of the donations um, so we did start a little seed library just last spring um, and these are the remnants of it just from this year so basically every spring this is all we had left and it went like wildfire um, so people would email us and during COVID we would run little packages out to curbside service and um, so we did it again this year and again, it was really, really well, um, you know, attended. So um, the only thing is, I'm not so sure yet if we are taking the seeds back. I guess I should have checked into that, but I will. Um, just because of COVID, we weren't taking any donations. So if, if anybody has seeds, um, like Jennifer said, just maybe package them up and keep them, uh, label them for this year, and we can probably take them from you next year. But uh yeah, I like that love in the mist is just beautiful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Beautiful flower. And I thought I have a hibiscus blooming at my house right now. And I'm going to try and save some seeds. So yeah, yeah. yeah. There's someone's so Christmas it, present. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I can put this recording on our YouTube channel. I don't know if you want to me to forward me the slides I can give to people or they can just do it from the YouTube channel to get the information. Did anybody have oh, questions? Yeah. Somebody just said that they would like a copy of the slides. So informative. Thank sure. you. Yeah. So however you want to do that, that's. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you a PDF. And then if anyone Perfect. reaches out to you, you've got it on hand for them. I will. I'll send it to anybody that registered this evening. Can I ask a question? Yes. Of course. I Hi, I'm Kathy. Oh, I got the C there. I don't wait. Oh, Kimberly, please. Okay, there I am. Now, I just wanted to ask I have sunflower seeds and I took the flower off the stalk, but I just have the stalk sitting out the back. What do I do? They're all dried out at this point. What do I do with them now? Oh, if they're dry, you can go ahead and put them into an envelope, but you haven't removed them from the flower head yet? Nope. 
No, they're sitting on a back on the back deck. They're just uh, on the flower. Like I cut the Perfect. stalk. That's yeah. The bird. If you don't, the birds are going to start pecking away at them if if they can get to it. So um, just pull the seeds off and then let them dry a little bit more when you can spread them out nice and thin. Okay. Um, and then put them in an envelope. Okay. So I'd go two weeks on a coffee filter or on okay. newspapers, okay? And then put them in your envelope. Okay, thank you very That's much. That's wonderful. So you're, are they the really big sunflowers? Yeah, well, they weren't so big this year. <laughs> I guess uh -huh, but you're but you want to keep them going forward so that's yeah, fun that's right yeah. yeah thank Wonderful. you very much I appreciate all this information mm -hmm. that's great information oh yeah well thank you for coming any more questions from anybody quiet group so I just want to let everybody know that Jennifer will be with us I think it's September 20th and she's going to do a program well similar to this I would imagine, but it's on teas and infusions. So I don't know if you can just say a couple of words about that. And Sure, sure. I'll, I'll talk about how to blend a particular tea and then the difference between making teas, which are just quickly steeped plants versus making herbal infusions, which are more nutritive, where you've let them steep for four hours and which plant goes with which category. Uh, and then how to dry those plants out. So if you do have a herb garden, just try and dry out a variety of plants, your mints, your hibiscus, your rose hips, um, whatever you can think to dry, your lemon balms, dry those out, and then we'll practice doing some tea blending. Oh, hot dog. Awesome, yes, looking forward to that one, Jennifer. So I guess that's it if nobody else has any questions. So we're good. Okay. Thanks again, Jennifer. We'll see you in September. See you in September. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good night, Thank everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.